Okay, so the Council of Trent says this sacrament is called by the church confirmation because there is no obstacle to the efficacy of the sacrament baptized persons when anointed with the sacred chrism by the bishop and with accompanying solemn words become stronger with the strength of a new power and thus begins to be a perfect soldier of Christ. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas explains that the confirmed um, giving witness to the name of Christ and performing these good acts, um, these acts, um, we, you know, we receive a special power in as much as that we are given, um, God is, you know, as much as God has called us to go forth, we're given a special power to do so. And it consists properly on a man's daring to confess the faith of Christ in the presence of anyone at all, and in a man's not being withdrawn by confusion or terror, for strength drives out inordinate terror. Therefore, the sacrament by which spiritual strength is confirmed on the one born again makes him, in some sense, a front-line fighter for the faith of Christ. And because fighters under a prince carry his insignia, they who receive the sacrament of confirmation are signed with the sign of the cross by which he fought and conquered. The sign they receive on the forehead is a sign that without blemish, they publicly confess the faith of Christ. So I, I kind of, what I got from that statement by St. Thomas is kind of like, like it's like our, our faith has to, is, is in the action of it. So as we, go forth and into these moments that we're maybe terrified in. Like as we go in that, we receive this grace and, and, th and then that terror is like driven out as we, as we trust and as we go forth. Um, and that, you know, we are, we are properly, if, when we're grounded in prayer, we are properly prepared um, by these sacraments to, um, to go out on this mission. We are soldiers of Christ. We have his insignia on us. Like he's already won the fight. We and so we we have a great king. We're called to be a perfect soldier of Christ. The faithful are given added strength to protect and defend the church, their mother, and the faith she has been given them. She has given them. So we're we're on a mission and and we have Christ is our king and what greater um what a greater king should we have i mean we really just in to realize who we are who we are serving what insignia we bear on our souls these indelible marks we have nothing to fear canon law states that the sacrament of confirmation impresses the character and by it, the baptized, continuing on the path of Christian initiation, are enriched by the gift of the Holy Spirit and bound more perfectly to the church. It strengthens them and obliges them more firmly to be witnesses to Christ by word and deed and to spread and defend the faith. So we are obliged in this mission. We, we can't run away from this mission and, and abandon our abandon our the, the troop out there and no we we're we're armed we've been given this and now we are obliged and um i think i think especially like something for me that i really am thinking about is this gift of strength that it is there and um and it is in this this acting out this this living this this sacrament out it, it it that is where we will win these battles is we have to engage in them um pope saint john paul ii said the grace confirmed by the sacrament of confirmation is more specifically a gift of strength this gift corresponds to the need for greater zeal in facing the spiritual battle of faith and and charity in order to resist temptation and give the witness of a Christian word and deed to the world with courage, fervor, and perseverance. This zeal is confirmed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Father went on to say, since the Middle Ages, theology, which developed in the context of, 
context of generous commitment to spiritual combat for Christ has not hesitated to highlight the strength given by confirmation to Christians who are called soldiers for God. So we're given this, this gift of strength and, and holy zeal. And, and if we are not feeling the, the zeal that we should be proper to this, we should, we should, we need to examine our consciences, make a good confession, ask for, you know, this for more zeal. And then I think just ultimately act it out, just, just live and strive. And, and the more gifts of, um, of zeal and strength will be, we'll, we'll notice it more. But we, if, if we aren't having, um, if we're feeling weak and we're, bra- we're breaking in sin a lot and we're lukewarm and not zealous, then um, we need to examine our consciences and, and make sure that we're, we're in the state of grace and open to God's gifts and what he's asking of us because we should have this gift of holy zeal. So um, we see this with the apostles after they have, um, after Pentecost, after they broke out of their fear in the upper room, the apostles begin to be persecuted. Um, And so I'm just going to read a little bit from um, Acts, I think it's chapter 4. When the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of Sadducees were filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in a public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell, all the, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. So the angels are exhorting them to go out and to preach. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers didn't find him there. So they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked with guards standing at the door. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, look, the men you put in the jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. But the Peter and the other dis- apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging on the cross. God exalted him. To his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And when they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put him to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men railed to him. He was killed, all his followers were dispersed, and all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go, For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will find, you will only find yourselves fighting against God. Um, So here the apostles are saying, we're we're, we're not obeying humans. We're going to obey God. And then this man is also saying, well, if this will just turn to nothing, but if it's, if it's of God, then it'll, it'll, you won't be able to do anything about it. 
His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. So here they did what they thought probably they never, they, they were so afraid of happening up in the upper room. Here they're going out, they're boldly teaching and preaching in God's, in Jesus's name. And then they got flogged for it. Horror, a horror. They, they got what they, they were afraid of probably. And what did they do? They rejoice. They rejoice because they were counted worthy for suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus and got to be like Jesus. And, um, and, and then they go out and they preach in his name more. They, they, um, for what, who, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory which overcometh the world, our faith. So <laughs> the apostles, they were preaching, it was of God. Because look at this, we're still, you know, thousands of years later now, we still have these, these Christians that go out and nothing stops them. And it seems that the more persecution and, and the more that, that we see this witness of the love of God and how it, the, the people that suffer have joy, it is just contagious. And this Holy Spirit is just spreading like fire. And, and it is a, a work of God. And so we're called um, to preach and to witness. And I think to different, you know, we, we are all called um, as we're all and brought into the, the priesthood of Christ, um, but more, you know, perfectly um, some are called to be priests and, and to actually to preach the word of God. And I mean, I, they definitely have the, the graces to do that. I think about that and, and to, but, but we also in our time and places have to, have to preach um, to proclaim um, God's word. And, um, and I think more sometimes it's, you know, um, there's certain authority that, that you have to, to do this, obviously, like parents need to, to preach to their kids. Um, and, and also priests have a, um, an authority that they, they should, they should preach and, and, um, and they, we should listen to them and obey our ma the magisterium of the church. And then there is witnessing as well, which is, um, you know, just, just, just being there with your life and, um, and being an example and, and to show our faith by our lives in action. Um, I thought this was a good little question to really think about, to reflect on, is that if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? To really think about your life, like, is, is it something is there something out there that the world can definitely pin you on? I mean, we should be, our faith should be causing some waves. It should be causing something because this, this world is hostile to our faith. And not that we should be causing trouble outrightly. We shouldn't do that. But, but it, it, it is, um, that, that would be, that's normal. That's, you know, I, I can't remember the scripture. It keeps running through my head, but Christ says, you know, you'll have all these good things and all these, I can't remember all the litany of the good things you'll have. And then you'll have persecutions as well. Like he like puts it on there like it's a good thing and it is, but to us it's not. But it's like that is the normal course of a Christian is we are going to follow our Lord. We're going to follow after him in the cross. And that's why those apostles were rejoicing because they were like, I'm doing the thing that Christ did. I'm, I'm doing I'm following him and I, and I'm being like him and I'm forgiving my, um, the aggressors, especially that's something so human 
it would be it's so hard to to forgive um wrongdoings against us and that we have to practice mercy over over justice in that <clears throat> and um so saint this is a picture of saint maximilian colby who i'm sure you all know he took the place of a of a father that uh a husband and father in um auschwitz concentration camp who was going to be killed for I think as a punishment for um, a prisoner escaping. And he stood up and said, I want to take his place. I am a Catholic priest. Simple as that. I, this is my, I, I'm, this is who I am. This is what I'm going to do. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm standing up. And um, I want, as we, um, move forward here, I'm going to kind of move the talk into um, the specific missionaries that helped form the, um, the American, I'm, I'm, uh, North America and, um, and how um, the missionary zeal has, has come over here. And so, but I think it was a, a year later, this priest, Father Leon Gutowski, who you guys probably heard me talk about, um, who was the priest at St. Michael's Iron River, right by us. Um, he was in our diocese for like 10 years. And um, he started, he came from Poland and, and he started dreaming about going back to Poland and, and he thought he, he, he was convinced it was God's will that he should go back and to serve his own people there. And, and then maybe after a couple of years, he'd come back here. But he wanted to, he felt this was for the love of God and to save souls. And that's what it says in his letter of request to go back to Poland from um, the Diocese of Superior. He was granted that request by the bishop and and i also thought this was appropriate because today is the feast of corpus christi and um it's june 11th today but june 12th um on june 12th 1941 father leon gatowski was back in poland and he he caught the attention of nazi the Nazi troops after he was leading a Corpus Christi procession. And then he was arrested five days later and sent to Dachau where I think 2,500 priests were killed. Um, and the historical records say that it was probably one of the most brutal year there, brutal years for Catholic priests. Um, just horrific famine. Um, and they were just treated very poorly, I think, during Holy Week. Um, and so I, reading some accounts of people that talked to him, oh, just to give a little more, I, um, he, Father Gutowski knew lots of languages. And that's something you'll see, too, of like how God, you know, maybe that gift of tongues, like as people are um, um, coming over earlier in the Americas and like how many languages people are able to learn um but it says that he was he was a very um a very kind priest always patient respectful never seemed annoyed um calm and he had just an ascetical outlook on that this was god's will and that was his he said if i survive this will or not then one must sacrifice them to themselves to God. So he made this as a sacrifice. And another quote he said was, will be. Um, so he was devoted to the will of God and, uh, and died here in, in Dachau. I don't know, maybe he'll end up, I, I really would like to learn more about him and maybe we'll have a, a saint, he's a martyr. So he had missionary zeal. Um, 
St. Teresa of Avila said, to teach by works more than words. And this picture is a picture of St. Francis of Assisi's shoes on the side. And he said, it is no use walking somewhere to preach unless our walking is our preaching. Like our very lives need to be what we are preaching. And I know that <clears throat> um, the third order that I'm in, it's a Franciscan third order, and they would, their recreation would be to go on a 12 mile walk. And, um, and they just would walk as fast as they could walk. That's all they would do for 12 miles. And they said they people would just be like, who is that? And like literally like their walking was preaching, just their being there, wearing their habit. Um, it should be preaching. Like we should be notably a Christian and, and, and we should be um, evangelizing by our very lives. <clears throat> Um, St. Cyril of Jerusalem said, forget not the Holy Spirit. At the moment of your enlightenment, he is ready to mark your soul with a seal. He will give you the heavenly and divine seal, which makes the devil already said that devil tremble. So remember, we have, um, we have the Holy Spirit, of course, as we go forth. Um, St. Marius said, the gospel is to be carried abroad. It is to be preached among the nations. Wherever then it is preached, it must be heard. So that all may hear, one must use one's feet to travel. And so do we travel with haste and urgency. Your footwear, footwear is not put on in order that you may walk about foolishly, but to accomplish the course of the gospel. In this way, you will receive the prophetic blessing. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. That was St. Theodore from and, and Isaiah. I mean, you think about that. How beautiful are the feet that bring the gospel, like eternal life. So... The um, the North American martyrs um, that these were some Jesuit missionaries <clears throat> who um, were all martyred, and I've always just been really inspired by their stories because, like, what they faced is just like unreal. Like, I think about you know last week when we had the mosquitoes in our house and. Um, just thinking about these priests that are like not only the mosquitoes, but like coming into just what what is even there? What are where they're coming to the new world? There's nothing there. There's just um, they're gonna make, put missions up and they're gonna go to people that are hostile. And they they how do you begin to communicate with them? Um. So these. These were Jesuits. There was three priests or six priests and two laymen um, and, and that were practiced heroic missionary efforts um, that just had so many hardships. Um, they sought to evangelize primarily the Huron Nation, where 20 to 30,000 people um, by Canada and New York State, I believe. Um, they they were pretty hospitable to them, um, but but um, they would sometimes then turn on the missionaries. Um, Let's see. So there's, I think the most notable one is probably Father Isaac, St. Father Isaac Jogues, who um, he arrived in, in New France, which I think that must be Quebec or something. And, um, and he headed a mission near Lake Huron. Seven years into his active and effective ministry, he was captured by the Iroquois and and they were beaten with clubs and hot, burned with hot coals. And they actually, they bit off some of his fingers down to his knuckle. And his thumb was severed. And, um, but despite all this torture, he survived. And 
attempted to witness um, to the captors that he was that he was captured by. Um, and then he was, um, after being imprisoned and used as a slave for 13 months, he escaped and made his way back to France where he was treated as a hero. And he was so concerned that he wasn't going to be able to distribute the body and blood of Christ because of his fingers. They, the Pope said, gave an exception, of course. Um, and then he came back after this and, and went back to um, the Americas and then was martyred finally. Um, I won't read through all these accounts. I was thinking of reading through them, but it would be kind of long. But basically, I mean, they were just tortured and, and killed and, and just went back and, and were just these shining stars of, um, of missionary zeal here. This Blessed Mary of Agrita, so I didn't realize this about her, but this was probably, well, this was like, I think, 1560s. Um, oh, 16, 1622 to 1625. Um, so she was a Spanish Franciscan nun, and she had just a... Um, a great zeal for, for souls. And she, you know, hearing about the Indians over in the Americas. And so she started, um, whenever she, she started praying, she started talking to God about, about um, wanting to save souls. She would be miraculously transported and by located. And there was like at least 500 times that she, um, that she bilocated it, and they, the way that they came to know about this was that um, there was 50 Indians from like a remote tribe in New Mexico that walked 500 miles to find Franciscan priests that they wanted to bring back to their tribe to be for them to baptize, and the, um, they were like, "How do you know about?" How do you know about the faith? How do you know these things? You know, who's, who's been talking to you? And they're like, they're, this lady in blue, this lady keeps appearing to us. And they thought at first it was the Blessed Virgin Mary, maybe. But um, um, describing what she looked like, they, um, they thought, well, I don't know if it is, if it is Our Lady. Um, but they described the habit and they thought it sounded like a, one of these Franciscan habits with the blue. And, um, and anyway, she would appear to these people and sometimes a couple times a day and she would tell them about Christ. And um, they, even at times some of like the shamans there would like um, persecute her and like try to kill her. And she, experience the pain of it and then she would come back and they would be like they they just they just can you know they're like what is going on like she she was so she was so real and there that they they just she just kept persisting and she um so they they ended up going back um the franciscans ended up talking to the um, the confessor of Saint of, of the Blessed Mary of Agrita and under obedience asked her, you know, if she knew anything about this and she explained all this, all these things about these people. She knew what they looked like. She knew the terrain better than they, they some of them even forgot about things over there that she knew about. She knew like some of the people there very well. Um, and so it was just, this like amazing thing that they came to realize that she had been bilocating there and they, they believed that it was actually physical because she would feel the, the change in temperature and everything like that, where she wasn't sure if she had physically been there or not. Although it, she remembered like get, having rosaries in her cell and then bringing rosaries there and then having them be gone and things like that. Um, and so the, they 
the Germano Indians that um, brought the two Franciscan priests back with them to their um, to their village, and they were met with these procession of all these people with a large wooden cross, and um, and they were very you know catechized and wanted their babies to be baptized, and there were ten thousand Indians that were um, that were baptized through her. Um, her body, interesting, is also incorrupt, I found out. Um, and this is just an account that um, she, how she explains that she said that um, looked like to me that one day after having received our Lord, his majesty showed me the whole world and I knew the variety of bread things. How admirable is the Lord in the university of the land. He showed me with great clarity the multitude of creatures and souls that existed and among them how few ones who were practicing the pure of the faith and that we're entering across the door of the baptism to be children of the Holy Church. The heart was divided of seeing that the copious redemption was not falling down, but on so few ones. I knew the gospel compliment, which they are so many who are called, but so few, the select ones. Between that much variety of those who were not practicing and confessing the faith, he declared me the part of creatures that had been better disposition to convert and then in his mercy was inclining more for those of the new mexico and other remote kingdoms of the of of that part the fact that the most High demonstrated me his will in this moved by spirit with new affections of love of god and neighbor and to cry out of the profound of, of my soul for the for those souls Um, and interestingly enough, her um, she was a, a really big um, inspiration for the later um, Franciscan and Jesuit missionaries that came. They, like um, Saint Uniper Osera, had a copy of her book, and he. Um, and then I also knew that um, Father or Blessed Solanus Casey. Um, also loved her her writing, and so she's really been an inspiration. I didn't realize that, and so that kind of brings me to the this towards the end of this talk is that so there is you know to to go out and to be a missionary and to physically do these things would be glorious. And I read an account. Um, I think it was Saint Mary of Agrita who said that like the angels in their heavenly bliss are if they could be envious would be envious of a missionary who is about who is about the work of saving converting souls like they would leave their heavenly beatitude to suffer the life of a missionary um this is how glorious it is and so i think we just really need to change like our optics of what is pleasing to god and and to think about that and to have that zeal that would suffer through persecution, mosquitoes, terrible hardships, but basically probably more likely in our lives, it will just be uncomfortable moments where you have to, to confess the name of Christ, where it feels out of step and it's going to maybe make a couple waves like we should have that. We need to have be grounded in the strength and zeal. Um, and so if we aren't physically going about necessarily being, you know, the missionary on the ground doing these, these grand things, suffering, um, we, I was led back as I was doing this talk, I, St. Therese of Lisieux came up, and of course that would seem fitting because she is the patron saint of um, missionaries and she never left her cloistered cell but she had such a great love for um, and, and wanting to save souls and she said to liberate only one soul I would gladly die many times over and so yes the, how beautiful are the feet that carry the word of the Lord but the the first part of our mission is to begin with love and the love of God first and love of others. 
to love Jesus and to make him loved. The, so the most important part is not really this, this physical walking part, but rather this beginning in the heart of, of wanting to save souls, zeal for souls. And how do we do that? Like um, St. Uh, is we have um, Blessed Mary of Agrita, her, it was in prayer. She was supplying graces, and they became quite miraculously, like, I mean, perhaps our prayers might help to bring about conversions um, you know, in ways that we wouldn't actually know. But, I mean, hers actually, like, fruitfully, she moved to another place and, was, and her prayers were efficacious in that way. Um, so if our mission, our mission should involve constant prayer. This is something we can, we can do always and then should, should, should strive to do. Determined not only to love God herself, but also to lead others to know and love him. St. Teresa offered her prayers and her own suffering for missionaries around the world. Secondly, the little flower teaches us that the mission involves constant prayer. Jesus knew that there would always be a vocations crisis, but he gave us the, rem the remedy to pray to the harvest master to send laborers for his harvest. Um, Pope Benedict XVI commented about how Jesus used to call his disciples only after praying during the night. Jesus had to acquire the disciples from God. He said this. The same is always true. We ourselves cannot gather men. We must acquire them by God for God. All methods are empty without the foundation of prayer. To be a missionary is to be a contemplative. Often we are tempted to solve problems primarily with worldly means, placing our trust in programs, campaigns, slogans, but it must begin with prayer. It must begin with God. So do we really pray for people to come to the faith? Do we? Pray as if lives depend on it? Do we intend for those on the front lines of the mission and those with vocations to missionary institutes? Do we pray for them? Do we beg God that every baptized Christian, beginning with ourselves, will discover and live the apostolic dimension of the Christian life with tongues of fire given by the Holy Spirit? Do we implore for each of us to realize, as Pope Francis stated in The Joy of the Gospel, that I am a mission on this earth. That is why I am here in this world. So I thought as we would um, conclude this, we could say the, um, the litany of the Jesuit martyr saints of North America. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. God, the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God, God the Holy Ghost, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Holy Mary, pray for us. Holy Mary, Queen of Martyrs, pray for us. Saint Isaac Job, pray for us. Saint John de Berbuff, pray for us. Saint Gabriel Lalamont, pray for us. Saint Anthony Daniel, pray for us. Saint Charles Gomer, pray for us. Saint Noel Chambonel, pray for us. Saint Rene Coupel, pray for us. Saint John de la de la Lande, pray for us. Pioneers of the cross in the New World. Pray for us. Heroic apostles of the faith. Pray for us. Zealous promoters of God's glory. Pray for us. Consumed with love for souls. Pray for us. Men of prayer and action. Pray for us. Lovers of poverty. Pray for us. Models of chastity. Pray for us. Faithful in obedience. Pray for us. Followers of Christ crucified. Pray for us. Fearless in suffering for Christ. Pray for us. Enduring cold and hunger for Christ. Pray for us. Stripped and scourged for Christ. Pray for us. Tortured by fire for Christ. Pray for us. Cruelly slain for Christ. Pray for us. 
peerless if peerless athletes of God. Pray for us. Loving children of the Queen of Martyrs. Pray for us. Filial clients of St. Joseph. Pray for us. Worthy sons of St. Ignatius. Pray for us. Our intercessors in heaven. Pray for us. Lamb of God, who takest away the sins of the world. Spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takest away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, who takest away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. <laughs> <laughs> Let us pray. O God, who has followed, has hallowed the first fruits of the faith in the northern regions of America by the preaching and bold and blood of thy blessed martyrs, John, Isaac, and their companions. Grant in thy mercy that through their intercession the plenteal harvest of the faithful may increase everywhere from day to day through our Lord Jesus Christ, thy Son, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Amen.